Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sure there'll be more people coming in, um, but let's get started. And I'd like to start by giving the floor to our great leader of the March Centre, Joy Lawn, to say a few words about March, and then I'll introduce this afternoon's seminar. Thank you, Andrew. I'll be very few words because I had no idea I was going to be called upon. Welcome all of you. Thanks so much for coming, especially because we're competing with some very nice weather for a change out there. Um, but I'm sure for those of you who were at our first life course event where we had uh, the inventor of the term life course, Professor Dana Ku, and we had uh, Cesar Victoria, who was a walking example of life course cohorts around the world. It was a fantastic start. But what you'll probably remember is the comments that Andrew made during the panel about how really it was all very boring compared to epigenetics and that everybody should be here for this seminar. So we know that this seminar is going to be even more fantastic. Thank you so much to Andrew, who's just back in from the States, for putting this together. He's going to introduce our two main speakers and the discussants, and I'm sure that you will uh, find that all of this will be not only uh, new, but I think also provocative and thoughtful. Um, so March, for those of you who... who uh, don't already know, this is the Maternal, Adolescent, Reproductive and Child Health Centre at the London School and brings together health through the life course uh, for women and for children with women and girls really at the heart of that. And we're split into three themes, adolescence, births and children. Uh, but I think the epigenetics through the life course goes through that and into the next generation. Um, so if you don't know about March and you're interested, please do take a report. We have uh, a listserv that you can sign up for uh, and other exciting events and opportunities to get involved. Uh, but meanwhile, I'll hand over to the main show. So, Andrew, thank you so much. Thank you, Joy, and thank you for all you do for March. You're a, a tremendous stimulator and leader, and we really appreciate it. Now... Epigenetics, what on earth is this all about? Some of you in the audience will be deeply ingrained in this already. So what we've tried to do is to put together a, a little program that will speak to those of you who kind of know that it might be important. You see it mentioned occasionally, and many of you may run away from it. This was a sense I got last time, that people are actually laughing at epigenetics and thinking, oh, come on, you're wasting your time. Let's stick to some real-life stuff. And I wondered whether to put together a few slides initially to make the point as to how important epigenetics is. But I've seen Lizzie's presentation, and she's going to make that point for us, both tell us the tiny bit of background about um, uh, what we're talking about with epigenetics, and also uh, a couple of cases that make very clear examples of how important epigenetics can be in terms of the phenotype. <coughs> but for those of you who aren't actually interested in epigenetics, but are interested in global health, and are interested in the life course, I would urge you to open your ears, um, it's very difficult stuff, it's really tough. Um, what we're going to talk about this afternoon is, is, is one tough part of it as well, whether or not there can be intergenerational messages. But in spite of the intergenerational bit, which we'll interestingly talk about today, even within a single generation, if you're interested in the effect of an early life exposure on later health, as many of us of course are in terms of the DOHAD hypothesis, Ask yourselves, well, there has to be something linking that early exposure with a later outcome. What might it be? How can I join the dots? And there are very many possibilities for that, but really highest on the agenda are one or more of <laughs> the possible pathways by which epigenetics holds a memory of what's happened early in life and then translates that into a physiological, a behavioral, or a public health outcome later in life. So it's really important stuff. We're just starting to get to grips with it, I would say, but you'll see from the presentations that you'll hear today that that just starting is already uh, huge steps forward. In the global scheme of science, we're still very much in the foothills of the Himalayas, um, but we al already know enough to show how very intriguing this area is,
not only how intriguing it is, but how ultimately it's going to be massively important. And one of the most fascinating things about epigenetics, and I'll leave you with this little thought, is that we've gone through this whole process of genomics and genetics and GWAS association studies. That's all well and good, although some people would say actually it hasn't been so good, it hasn't led us very far. But epigenetics, to me as a nutritionist, is, is far more interesting because the epigenome is potentially modifiable by the mother's diet. And Matt has a paper coming out this week which tells a, a fascinating story about that particular, story, that particular issue. So think of it on that basis as well, that it's potentially modifiable and therefore very exciting. So, with those few introductory words, I'd now like to introduce Lizzie. Lizzie Radford is a very talented individual. She's the kind of individual one can love to hate, actually, because she's, uh, she did her undergraduate... <laughs> Don't worry, Lizzie, I'll come to the reason why. <laughs> she did her undergraduate degree in uh, medicine and in uh, developmental biology, if I've got that right. Uh, that was at Cambridge, right? <coughs> at Cambridge. And then she's uh, carried on through her clinical training, but taken time out to do a PhD in epigenetics and development. And she's very interested in the crosstalk between environment and epigenome. She's back in her clinical training at the moment. Um, we'll have a show at hand of hands at the end of this as to whether she should continue with science or just be a, a medic. But the reason she's so annoying is that she has a fantastic science paper out recently despite of all that multitasking and so forth. So, Lizzie, over to you. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I'm slightly fearful that I won't live up uh, to, my, to my introduction. Um, and thank you very much for the um, invitation. It's a real privilege and a, and a pleasure to be here. Um, and I hope that it, this will... Um, introduce those of you who haven't heard about epigenetics before to something that you find um, interesting and exciting and as Andrew said um, my background is clinical and epigenetics you know I, I actually grew up abroad and my, I was totally focused on, on a sort of career in tropical medicine and um, epigenetics really kind of really was so exciting that I took a massive diversion so I hope I can convey some of the reason why and um, that happened uh, to you this evening. So what I would like to try and cover um, in, in this half an hour is a brief introduction to ep epigenetics, which is, will be very simplistic. So it, it's really just to sort of whet your appetite if you find this interesting. Briefly cover why I think it's important for child health. And then introduce you to an area which is actually incredibly controversial. Um, and I want to say this up front because um, it's, it's not established and, and the data that I, I would like to share with you um, I think are interesting but there are lots of questions that they, in fact they raise I think more questions than um, they answer. But I think this is a really interesting and exciting area where um, both uh, epidemiologists and, and um, basic scientists um, need to be working together to move forward to find out what's going on. So what are epigenetic marks? Well, the two, um, the two broadest groups are DNA methylation, which is the covalent um, attachment of uh, methylation to cytosine um, in, the, in, the, in the DNA code, and histone modifications, where the tail of um, the histone proteins, which form an octamer, uh, which we sort of conceptualize like a bead around which the DNA is wrapped, um, is again covalently modified and, and, and this alters the steric interaction. So if you imagine this sort of superstructure where DNA is wrapped around beads which are then coiled together and progressively coiled um, down further, it changes how, how tightly that, um, that molecule is packed. And the reason that's important is it then controls the access to the genetic code. So by changing your epigenetic marks, you change how um, how accessible certain segments of, the, of that genetic code are um, to factors in the nucleus, like transcription factors. And so this is how the um, cells control whether genes are turned on and off. 
And is that important? Well, yes, it's, it's, it's enormously important. So as we develop from a zygote, a single cell, which has the potential to go on to form all the cells in the body, something has got to control that process because there are thousands of different um, cellular uh, phenotypes. And it's epigenetic marks which are different, which are accumulate as um, cells go on and differentiate, which control which genes in the, in the DNA code are on and which are off. Because every cell has the same genetic information, but cellular phenotypes are dramatically different. And that has to be remembered through mitosis, so that as you develop an organ, um, all the cells within that organ have a sort of coherent identity. And that's also important because when you cut yourself, for example, and um, cells in your skin divide, they have to remember to make skin. They have to never, you know, it wouldn't be very helpful if they made a blob of liver there by mistake or something like that. And so this is very important for, for uh, as a fundamental process in development and therefore important for, for child health. But it's also, it's also interesting because if we're interested in going in the reverse direction, so if we want to be able to take a sample of skin and turn it into spinal cord, for example, or turn it into liver or kidney, we have to know how to undo those epigenetic marks. And so there's a huge interest at the moment in the area of regenerative medicine on um, how, that how we might go in the reverse direction in order to, um, in terms of... Uh, uh, developing organs and, and new, new tissue treatments. And um, as Andrew alluded to, there's also a lot of interest in um, the role of epigenetic marks in common disease. So if epigenetic marks form the cellular memory of, of cellular phenotype, can they also form the cellular memory of environmental effects? So may they be the mechanism through which um, the environment alters gene expression and results in, in disease phenotypes. And so a lot of people are looking in big um, human cohort studies and, and twin studies to, to try and disentangle um, the role of epigenetic marks in, in these um, diseases. But there's something very special about epigenetic marks, which is that they have to be right, wiped off every generation. So you can't just go on accumulating cells when you go uh, accumulating um, your sort of epigenetic identity. If you want to make a germline, that germline has then got to be able to form a zygote which can make everything again. So it's like going back to a ground state, if you like. So um, what happens is um, in the process of primordial germ cell formation, which actually happens in utero, um, I think I can just about point from here. So um, primordial germ cells uh, are forming in the last uh, trimester of pregnancy, and um, sorry, in the, in, well, throughout pregnancy, but in the sort of, uh, we think it's difficult to know in humans, but in, in the mouse we know very well, in, in um, between the first, uh, at the end of the first week, you get this erasure of um, epigenetic marks, both histones and uh, histone marks and DNA methylation in primordial germ cells. And then um, marks are put back on um, in, in particular places because um, epigenetic marks are very important for maintaining uh, chromosomal um, stability, controlling uh, retro transposons and repetitive elements in our DNA. So um, it, it is important that they're put back on, but in a very carefully controlled way. And in male primordial germ cells, this happens actually before birth. Most of this process is complete by the, by the time a child is born. And therefore, um, while in, in females, this goes on um, during the growth phase of the oocyte. Um, but this, this meant to us that we were very interested as whether the environment can affect this process um, in utero. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you some data about that a bit later. And then this, uh, there's a second phase of epigenetic reprogramming that happens in the zygote. So um, immediately following um, fertilization, there's a wave of, of, of erasure of epigenetic marks. And this happens more, more quickly on the paternal DNA than on the maternal. So the reason I'm telling you this is, is because, because of this, we thought for years that Lamarck was wrong. So Lamarck proposed this theory of evolution, which was inheritance of acquired characteristics. And actually, the giraffe 
this is not, he, he didn't use the giraffe as an illustration, but I rather like the giraffe, so I'm using it. Um, but this idea that, you know, you, as, you, as you sort of strive to achieve something as an individual, you may then pass that on to your offspring um, directly instead of culturally, but through a sort of epigenetic uh, code. And so we've all rather mocked the mark because we, we struggle to find evidence for this in nature. And then um, these two phases of epigenetic reprogramming suggest that actually all environmental um, epigenetic marks are erased. And so you don't pass anything on to the next generation. But um, Marcus, uh, I think, will go on and tell us a bit later about um, the studies in human populations. So there's, look, there's increasing evidence from human populations, and I, I will talk about the um, animal models that suggest that actually there, there are um, intergenerational and even transgenerational phenotypes, um, and suggest that actually um, we may have missed uh, the fact that information is being passed on. And um, there's some, been some very nice big studies in the mouse that have looked exactly at that pro phase of reprogramming and demonstrated that it's a bit more leaky than we previously thought it was. So does epigenetics matter in, in the human? Does it produce human phenotypes? Well, we know from the imprinting um, disorders that you can, if you inherit aberrant epigenetic marks and the germline from your parents, you can have very striking fundamental phenotypes, um, particularly affecting neurodevelopment um, and, uh, and metabolism. And um, so we know that we know that you can have a, a very, actually a very small region of the DNA that has a, a changed epigenetic state that can fundamentally affect um, the course of human, develop, uh, of human development and produce very severe um, disease phenotypes. And as um, Andrew alluded to, uh, many of us are interested in the impact of the early life environment um, on uh, the risk of, of later um, disease. And I think Marcus will tell us about um, these studies that are starting to demonstrate that these risks can actually be, be transmitted over multiple generations. But what about in the mouse? So. Um, these two mice ha have really been the cornerstone of a lot of this um, research in the, in the um, animal field. So they're both genetically identical. Um, so they're effectively identical twins, if you like, but they differ just in a very small region of DNA, which has different epigenetic marks between um, the two. So this is the agouti gene, which um, which encodes uh, genes for hair color and also is involved in metabolism. There's a repetitive uh, region um, that has jumped in upstream of this. If this region is methylated, um, it is inactive. And so then this gene is, is allowed to control its own expression. And you have a brown mouse, um, because the agouti is turned on very specifically during hair follicle development, and it's a, a lean, healthy mouse. If this region is actually unmethylated, um, the, the promoter of this repetitive region overrides the normal control of this gene. And you have a, a yellow and fat mouse who, who has a, a host of metabolic phenotypes. And what's very interesting, um, and which Vardman and, um, and others have shown, is that um, you can have the, 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 the color of this mouse, and therefore their methylation state here affects that of their offspring. So there is some inheritance between the generations of the um, epigenetic state at this region, suggesting that actually these, those um, reprogramming phases that I told you about earlier may, may, be, may not be as thorough as we previously thought. So what about um, in animals? What about environmental models of um, intergenerational effects? So there's a, a host of different um, models demonstrating that any kind of stress or, um, or suboptimal environment in utero um, results in an increased risk of metabolic disease and also behavioral phenotypes um, in the F1 generation, and that's very well established. What was very interesting to us as epigeneticists is that when you um, breed an affected male, so a male who has been undernourished 
when he was in utero, or his mother was undernourished when he was in utero, with a control female who's, been, who's had a completely normal life, unaffected by any kind of environmental compromise. You, result, you have a, an offspring who has an increased risk of metabolic disease. And because we, because we remove the social element in these mouse models, because the males are removed immediately following uh, mating, so they have no kind of um, role in, in bringing up the offspring, if you like, this suggests that some information must be transmitted in the sperm. And one very good candidate for that is um, different epigenetic marks on that um, individual sperm. And as I told you, the, um, the epigenetic marks of his sperm are being established when he is in utero. So this, this suggests that the environment may, may um, impact that process, resulting in inheritance of a phenotype across multiple generations. And others have actually shown that, you, that you, um, adult diet can have an effect as well. Um, and uh, environmental, um, sit the situation around early life um, is, is also important, so not, not just intrapartum, but, but later as well. So to what extent is epigenetics involved? And as I mentioned before, this is very controversial and, um, and ignites very healthy debate within the field. And I think I just want to walk you through um, our process of designing these experiments um, to, to explain some of the challenges of, of doing these, ex is ex these experiments, because they're not at all easy to, to do. So the epigenetic changes that we're looking for may be very subtle, and it may be challenging to detect functional changes over background variation. If we're going to do that, we need to have a really hard think about what background variation constitutes. And there obviously will be some element of normal inter-individual variation. But it's difficult to know at this point how much is normal. But there's um, some very big international collaborations which are, are looking at this at the moment. And so I think that data is, will be um, available to us all very soon. Then there's genetically conferred variation. And we're just starting to unravel the relationship between epigenetic and genetic variation. And it's an, imp an, important, um, an important one. And then there's environmentally induced variation, which is obviously what we are interested in when we're looking at these environmentally um, induced intergenerational phenotypes. So um, when we think about looking for this, we need to think hard about what form of epigenetic marks to look for, where to look for it, um, when to look, and how much there will be, if indeed any, because there may, there, there may not be any, or there, it, it may be so subtle it's very difficult to detect and whether to take an a priori candidate-based approach or to take a more whole genome unbiased approach. And we've taken both, but I will just uh, tell you about the latter, the unbiased approach. So um, I just want to introduce you to the animal model that we use. So this was set up by Mary Elizabeth Patty, who's um, a fantastic collaborator based at the Jocelyn Institute in Harvard. And uh, what they do is during the, the last uh, week of gestation, they undernourish um, female mice by 50%. And they use a, an ICR um, strain, which is actually genetically outbred, which allows us um, to better, better model the human population, but does complicate some of the analysis uh, because of that. Um, and unsurprisingly, the offspring are small when they're born. And if we then generate a second generation, an F2 generation, where either both parents were our controls, only dad was undernourished, only mum was undernourished, or both parents were undernourished when they were in utero, but importantly, this pregnant female, we feed um, completely ad libitum, so she has um, unrestricted access to standard mouse chow. Um, we have we produced a generation where if your father was undernourished in utero, you are also small at birth. And that was very interesting to us because, as I said, the males are removed, so that suggests that some information is being carried through the sperm that is transmitting this low birth weight phenotype. We then went on to look at, at, at a metabolic phenotype, and it's much more complex than this, but this is Mary Elizabeth's work, so I, I will just um, show you a, a, a sort of broad overview, which is that they all animals whose parents were undernourished become glucose intolerant. So the questions when we wanted to look at the germline for epigenetic marks that we set out to answer were, 
is DNA methylation um, affected? And we started with DNA methylation uh, probably because it's the easiest. Um, there are a, a sort of myriad histone marks, and so um, we started first of all with DNA methylation, but we're now going on to look at some, some other epigenetic modalities. And we wanted to look both at total levels and then the distribution of DNA of methylation across the whole genome. We wanted to ask if we found any regions which are affected, um, where, what characterizes those regions? Is it randomly, are they randomly distributed or is there something that makes them susceptible to altered methylation? And then finally, we wanted to try and um, see if we could draw the link with the next generation because clearly it's, it, it, if, if you can't make the phenotypic link with the, with the next generation, it's an interesting academic exercise, but it doesn't necessarily um, lead you uh, any further in understanding the phenotype. And this is really the most challenging um, part. So um, just briefly, there's absolutely no change in total DNA methylation. So we use mass spectrometry to do this. And we looked at both um, methylation and hydroxymethylation, which is um, uh, a variation of methylation but has a very different role in the genome. And because um, the levels of hydroxymethylation are extremely low, I won't go on to talk about that any further. We le left that analysis there. In terms of distribution, um, I just want to talk you through how we designed um, our experiment because I think it's important with regards to um, the challenges that I um, talked about earlier. So we use a 50% um, caloric restriction, which, is, which coincides with the reprogramming of the, um, of the epigenetic marks in the primordial germline. We then pooled sperm from multiple individuals from multiple different litters. And we did this to try and minimize the inter-individual variation um, that we're not interested in, um, and also to minimize the genetic variation that we're, we're not interested in. We then used a technique um, called uh, MEDIP, which is short for methylation. Uh, so uh, you basically you use a, an antibody to, um, which is binds specifically to the methylated cytosines in your um, genome, and then you uh, chop up all your your DNA and you pull it down using um, little beads. And the reason that we use this is that this technique is actually very bad at identifying. Um, uh, single CPGs, so single cytosines that are different between your case and your controls. Um, MEDIP is actually very poor at identifying that. The reason we didn't want to identify those sort of changes is we think that those are more likely to be the ones that are caused by genetic variation, for example, so we're not interested in finding those. Then we did whole genome um, uh, sequencing and carried out two independent um, comparisons and then asked which um, regions were affected in common between those. So what we find is actually quite a small number of regions are affected and the majority of them lose methylation, so they're hypomethylated. Because it's always important when you do one of these um, whole genome studies to uh, validate your data by an independent technique just to make sure that you're not barking up completely wrong tree and this is all technical artifact. We used another technique called bisulfite pyrosequencing um, and essentially you just you use a, 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 the bisulfite to modify the, the DNA and then by comparing um, it, it changes the base which is uh, it changes your cytosine sequence. So um, by then comparing, sequencing your, your two fractions, you can then identify sort of by subtraction where you had a methyla methylation um, uh, moiety on your cytosines. And we were very pleased. This, allowed, this demonstrated that actually all of the regions which had lost methylation um, validated. None of the regions which we thought had gained methylation validated at all. Um, suggesting that all of those were just uh, technical artifacts. And um, I just want to point out a couple of things about uh, these regions which had lost methylation. The, the changes in methylation that we see is between about 10 and 30 percent, um, which is quite good for these environmental sort of studies. That's quite a big change in methylation. But as a field, we haven't yet really established how big a change in methylation you need to, to change um, gene expression, and, and that's a problem. Um, 
these regions all have a low absolute methylation level and other groups have demonstrated that regions with that with methylation in that sort of range between um, 10 and 60 percent are enriched in regulatory elements so regions of the of the of DNA which control expression of genes um, and that suggests to us that this may actually be important so um, in terms of regions which are, are susceptible to methylation change, they're not repetitive, which makes sense because you wouldn't. There's good reasons why you wouldn't want to unmethylate your your repetitive sequence in your in your germline, and they're mostly intergenic. And they are enriched with CPG islands, which again are known to be enriched um, in uh, regulatory elements. So when you um, in the process of making sperm, you have to c pack a large length of DNA into an absolutely tiny nucleus. And the sperm nucleus is much smaller than, um, than normal cellular nuclei. And so to do that, they, what um, the body does is removes the majority of histones, which I told you about earlier, and replaces them for a different protein, uh, uh, a different protein called protamine, which then allows the um, DNA to be twisted even further, and so packed into an even smaller space. But what we do, what we've learned in recent years, is that actually histones are retained in certain regions of. of of the genome, and that's not random. Those regions look as though they might be important in early development. So um, we collaborated with Antoine Peters, who's done this looking in, in mouse sperm, and asked whether our regions which have altered um, DNA methylation are enriched in, um, in regions that retain histones at all. And the answer is, is yes. So we, we, it's statistically very um, significant, but here I'm just going to show you some of the raw data tracks. So these are our control and um, in utero undernourished males. Um, and you can see that the peaks, uh, the methylation uh, peaks are smaller um, in the undernourished males. And it overlaps perfectly with these peaks of micrococcal nuclease, which is an enzyme which digests histones specifically. And so we can see that at this region where methylation was lost, um, it was likely also packaged with um, a histone as opposed to a protamine. And this is important because, as I told you before, histones can be modified and that is an important uh, form of epigenetic information. So it suggests that our regions which have altered DNA methylation are going in in a chromatin context into the embryo. And so there may be some additional histone, um, trans histone um, conferred information that's going through at those regions as well. So what is the impact on the next generation? So um, I told you that, that there's this second um, zygotic phase of reprogramming, and clearly um, our um, altered, um, altered methylation isn't going to be very interesting, or, or at the moment we think it won't be very interesting if it's all just erased in the zygote. Um, so when we compared um, our data with an already published um, data set looking at how leaky this um, erasure um, is in the zygote, we found that about half of our regions actually seem to escape um, erasure to some extent, suggesting that um, a good number of our regions could have methylation that then persists through into the zygote and into the um, early embryo and affects development. So we were encouraged by this, so we went on and looked directly at methylation levels in, um, in late gestation of the second generation, and it's very clear that there's absolutely no difference there at all. Um, in fact, that's not entirely true. There's a few regions that have very tiny differences in methylation, but this is in the order of about 5%, and we're not sure how sort of functionally relevant that is. But it does suggest that there may have been, um, there may have been altered methylation that persisted through the zygote and has been slowly lost in the two, um, two and a half weeks of gestation until we uh, looked at the embryos at this point. So what about gene expression? Because I've told you that um, these uh, altered methylation came through in a chromatin context and also that we don't really know whether um, they may have some effect in the very early embryo in the zygote. And when we look at gene expression of, of genes that are on either side of these um, DMRs, these altered methylation regions, we see very clearly that there is an enrichment of um, perturbed expression, but that's tissue-specific, so it's not the same between brain and liver. Um, and we took a sample of sort of 20 um, randomly selected genes and actually 
didn't find any that are uh, significantly altered, suggesting that this um, so this suggests to us that there is in some way some memory um, of that altered sperm methylation, but at the moment we're not entirely sure what it is. And just very briefly, we also had to look in the pancreas because the pancreas is very important to the phenotype of these individuals. And one of our regions of altered methylation lies in this, in this locus, which encodes um, the subunits of the um, uh, ATP-sensitive pota uh, potassium channel, which I'm um, sure you all know plays a very um, critical role in controlling insulin secretion and maintaining glucose homeostasis. And we do have um, moderately altered expression of one of those subunits in young adult pancreas um, tissue. And when we challenge um, those um, um, those channels with uh, tolbutamide, we have a very blunted response in, in individuals whose fathers um, were undernourished. And actually, um, there's also a, a reduced basal um, insulin secretory response. So we don't see any suppression um, uh, with diazoxide, but that's actually because the um, base level of insulin secretion in these individuals is um, reduced. And similarly, they secrete less insulin in a, in a glucose tolerance test. So in summary, what have I said? And I hope it has been at approximately the right sort of level. We don't see um, any changes in total um, DNA methylation in, in sperm of males who were undernourished in utero, but we do see um, loss at discrete genomic um, regions. And these regions are, have a low absolute methylation level. They are non-repetitive and they're mostly found between genes. Um, they're enriched in nucleosomes. Um, and I haven't shown you this, uh, but they're, they're late to remethylate during germ cell reprogramming, reprogramming, and we can talk about that if anyone's interested later. Um, about half of them are resistant to the zygotic um, reprogramming phase, and despite that, in late gestation of the next generation, there doesn't seem to be any meaningful difference in methylation. But um, we do see, uh, at the same time, a sort of legacy of altered um, expression of genes, and that's tissue specific. So I warned you that I think this raises more questions than it answers. So the questions that, that I have are, I still, I don't feel that we've really got to the bottom of whether methylation is important mechanistically in this model. Um, and partly that's because we don't know how big a methylation change is required to link gene expression and phenotype. We, we know for certain regions, like imprinted genes, but in general, we, we still struggle with that. Um, and there may be other epigenetic modalities involved. But if methylation is important, we haven't got to the bottom of how it's being transferred, um, how that memory is being transmitted through to the adult, because it's not being transmitted simplistically as altered DNA methylation. And another thing just to highlight is that we look in populations of cells, and obviously an individual sperm is either methylated or not, and 30% um, methylation can mean quite different things when you, when you look at um, a population of cells. And finally, a mouse is not a human, and do different lifespans and ecological niches have an effect? Do they matter? They almost certainly will mean that different environment, um, evolutionary pressures will have been put on this um, sort of... Uh, ability to transmit information through the germline. Um, and we know a lot from plants and, and lower organisms like worms who do a lot of this. Um, and maybe this data is suggesting that mice do a little bit less and we sort of, you know, the jury's still out as to whether this is relevant for humans. But I think, I think it is. Obviously, I, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think it was important. So um, just finally, my mental, um, through all of this, has been Anne Ferguson-Smith, who's absolutely fantastic. and you get a chance to um, hang out with her. She's great fun. Um, and our um, wonderful collaborators at the Jocelyn in Harvard, um, Mary Elizabeth, and her postdoc, Elvira, with whom I've um, interacted very closely. And um, many thanks. Well, thank you, Lizzie, for a, a superb introduction on the animal side of it. We're not going to take any questions just now. Um, we're going to hear from Marcus next on the, on the human angle to this, see if we've got any evidence um, for the intergenerational stuff. Now, some of you will have found some of that hard going, but that was 
partly the intention. We want to just get the right level between challenging you with the difficulties of this field, but not making you so overburdened by it that you all run away from it and don't think about it ever again. Um, so um, I'm going to try and multitask now and see if I can get uh, Marcus's slides up at the same time as introducing him. Uh, where are your slides? Here we go. Um, so Marcus Pembry is a clinician, a clinical geneticist who is, has been interested in the atypical irregular, ir inheritance. irregular <laughs> inheritance, which can lead to some of the kind of phenotypes that you've seen um, Lizzie's pictures on. Um, Marcus was first at Guy's, then at the Institute of Child Health, and is now emeritus, but is um, a visiting professor at Bristol as well. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Marcus for the first time only a few weeks ago, um, but within a very short period of time over a glass of wine. And he wasn't showing off at all. He was actually talking to someone else, and I was listening to it. Um, but he explained how, you know, with uh, three hours in the library and some really critical thinking, you could work out a pathway that... Um, actually might still be opaque to all the bioinformatics that you want to throw at it. Um, so a lovely mixture between just really thinking about the logic of one family with um, irregular inheritance and how that can tell us something about epigenetics. And I gather that's probably what brought you into this field. So with no further ado... Well, uh, Andrew, thank you very much indeed uh, for inviting me, and um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, and I'll, I think I can point if I needed to, but um, yes, that's fine. Um, now, I was asked to talk about emerging evidence human studies. Now, you see, I've added my own title under there, and that is Human Studies of Transgenerational Responses. That is an idiosyncratic phrase I use for um, the phenomenon that we can observe in, in humans. Um, and it, um, it's purely to make sure that I'm not implying any particular mechanism. I'm looking at um, the, uh, the data and uh, um, uh, you'll see how we try and uh, bring the story together. Now, as we've heard, it comes with a lot of historical baggage. Um, Lamarck, in fact, um, was, uh, uh, made huge contributions to uh, 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 biology. After all, he was living long before uh, Darwin was doing his work, uh, more or less contemporary with Darwin's grandfather. And uh, in 1908, um, uh, the French, of course, were uh, very keen uh, to uh, honour him and uh, indeed uh, had an international subscription to produce this, uh, this plaque, uh, this uh, sculpture. And, well, we've already heard that uh, um, it's possible that some of what Lamarck said uh, will be avenged. This, this image here is actually um, one of his daughters who acted as his um, assistant uh, when he went blind in the, in the later parts of his of his. Uh, uh, scientific career. So the, the, there's a lot wrong with Lamarck, but there's a lot right with him as well. Now, the sins of the father. We're going to concentrate down the male line, I'll, I'll explain in a minute. And um, uh, uh, Oliver Rando um, has said what lots of people have said over the years. Well, why hasn't the, these transgenerational effects been actually observed by all the brilliant uh, uh, geneticists over the last uh, a hundred years. And, and it's a very good question, and I think the answer is this. Um, firstly, and this is just uh, based on human stuff, uh, firstly, there are exposure, exposure sensitive period, periods in the ancestors, uh, in the parents or the ancestors' early life. So exposure at one time won't produce an effect. The next is that there are sex specificities both in the transmissions and in descendant outcomes. And also, the descendant outcomes depend on the um, uh, timing of the exposure. You get a different outcome on the offspring of it. And, so, and also, it's not just Lamarckian 
inheritance of acquired characteristics, or phenotypic transmission, which is a, another phrase of saying the same phenotype follows on through down the generations. So there were lots of reasons, but the main reason was that everybody became very satisfied with their view of inheritance. It seemed adequate. The modern synthesis came in after the war and lasted until the turn of the century. But it also had some impacts on the way we thought about them. For example, um, people didn't were so certain that exposure of the father when he was uh, preconceptually uh, would not produce a biological effect on his offspring, that when you actually found it, you said, ah, oh, well, that shows that there must be some social confounding that we haven't taken into account. And this went, you know, these are brilliant people, right up until 2011, I think there was a paper, still promoting this, uh, which of course is completely ridiculous, if indeed there were these biological effects that we've seen. But then, this is the big challenge that we have uh, in human studies, uh, where we can't do experiments. Why couldn't the transgenerational effects just be mediated by a combination of genetic inheritance, which can be very complicated sometimes, and social transmission. And any family um, album could put together something like this. Uh, my own family uh, illustrates it quite nicely. On the genetic side, we have my uh, 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 daughter and son who um, have red hair, which uh, neither my wife Heather or I have. And uh, um, you can see plenty of uh, trans cultural transmission from grandparental to uh, grandchild, and also, of course, uh, uh, sib to sib um, uh, cultural learning, um, and um, not to mention school and parental stuff. So, so it's very difficult. We have to find a way of showing things where that isn't the explanation. Well, the first thing to say is we're completely confounded if we try and study it down the female line. You know, don't forget you all lived inside the previous generation for nine months or thereabouts, and, and there is a sort of Russian doll effect with all sorts of ways in which signals uh, can come down from the mother transplacentally or in the egg cytoplasm with the mitochondria, all these things. That, that's not rewriting anything at all. That's been known for ages. And, uh, and, you know, breast milk, the gut biome, all sorts of ways of that. So that is why this is the question that we've been focusing on and why indeed uh, this is been talking about male line stuff principally. Because it's, the question is, do these carry information about the parental or ancestral early life environment or their experience? Now, in order to describe some of the things we're doing, I had to invent a new form of pedigree. This is the traditional pedigree, of course, uh, symbols here. But if you're trying to look at the life course elements and uh, what's happening down the generations, you have to um, start here with a fetus, then you have uh, life up to an adult, and then um, reproduction, of course, then the fetus is in the, in the uh, adult mother of the next one and so on. And uh, I will be using these pedigrees um, in illustrating, summarizing some of the data. And so that's why I wanted to introduce it straight at, uh, right at the beginning. Now, this is just a summary of the human population based studies that are um, available at present that have been peer reviewed. I will refer to one that is um, sort of out there but um, economists don't necessarily go in for peer review in the way we think about it. Um, this is all, the main reason also for putting this up is that we've summarized all this in a review um, uh, uh, recently, um, uh, 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 or at least much of the data. I'm going to be talking about Northern Sweden, where we have transgenerational response. We have father to son and paternal parents to grandchildren. The exposure is the swings in the food supply, starvation or, uh, or uh, plenty of food supply, and the outcomes are basically based on um, the death certificate. So it's mortality rate, uh, vascular disease and diabetes. And then the Avon Longitudinal Study of 
parents and children, Ausback. We have father to son effects, which I'll be showing you, and uh, also parent to offspring effects um, of smoking. Um, and um, there's also uh, the only other data I know uh, is from uh, betel nut chewing, which is rather like smoking in many uh, ways, where it's the paternal exposure uh, during um, early adult life, and the outcome is uh, uh, early metabolic syndrome. Now, what about the Ovacarlex data? Because this really started it off um, in terms of the actual data. There have been plenty of speculation papers written before. Ovacarlex is close to the Arctic Circle in northern Sweden. This is the river Carlex, and uh, this is the small community here, had their own language, very isolated, particularly during the winter months, going back. And they had, found, this is a typical farm. In fact, my colleague, uh, Oli B. Gren, this is his, uh, this is his family farm here. Um, the uh, important thing is that there was no rescue with food supplies if they had a bad harvest and, no, uh, and uh, not very good storage if they had a good harvest. So the, w the nutrition, we have evidence of th in these big swings. Um, the other thing is that um, the king in, um, I think it was 1798, decided he was going to collect information on harvests and food prices in order to make sure he was getting tax. And so Sweden had this amazing democratic uh, information that uh, Oli used. Now, what I'm going to do, obviously I can't go all through all the studies, but this is to pull out the timeline of the over Carlitz ausback collaborations uh, um, that result in the emergence of the sex-specific nature of this, because the whole of the studies have all had specific research questions, specific hypotheses, one feeding off the other. Um, Oliver uh, B. Gren contacted me in 2000 because of a paper I'd uh, speculating on uh, transgenerational things I'd written in 2000 s in, in uh, 1996, and. Um, his early work showed that uh, longevity was associated with the paternal, it's always done the paternal side in Overcolic, the paternal ancestor nutrition in mid-childhood. So he defined this period, he called it the slow growth period, he defined this as an exposure sensitive period. He had thought it was the accelerated growth into puberty was going to be it, but it wasn't. That turned out to be the control. And then um, he looked at other things on the death certificate and uh, amongst these were, of course, the uh, paternal grandfather's good food supply uh, was associated with uh, a fourfold risk of diabetic death. There were only 19 diabetics. They did all come from different families and so on. But we are always, as always, uh, dealing with relatively small numbers. Um, we got interested um, in, and started looking in Ausback using smoking as an exposure, and I'll come back to that. And we got some evidence, not terribly strong, but uh, that smoking uh, in the mid-childhood period, the onset of smoking then, was associated with uh, effects in the uh, offspring, and in particular in the sons. And so we immediately asked Ollie, were there any sex-specific effects in the um, overcarlic data? Because up to 2005 that hadn't really been looked at. And in the answer is yes, very dramatic ones in fact. The paternal grandfather's food supply just affects, I've just associated with, I should say, um, uh, the mortality rate of his grandsons, but not the granddaughters. Paternal grandmother's food supply just uh, is associated with the mortality rate of her granddaughters, but not grandsons. And this crisscross transmission helps the control for the paternal line social confounders and uh, we also showed that it persisted um, when we took the, uh, the um, grandchild's early life experiences into account. So this is the sort of thing one had if one's plotting, um, in this case just um, the uh, good food supply versus the moderate. Uh, some of the other uh, graphs will have uh, poor food supply as well and you can see that the um, paternal uh, paternal grandmother's food supply um, in their mid-childhood period um, affected the mortality rate of the, uh, the longevity of the 
of the granddaughters but not the grandsons and the reverse the paternal grandfathers um, and the uh, grandsons but the real interesting question was uh, having got this sex specific effect um, and we felt we were a bit more confident it, could we explore the nutrition sensitive periods during development using this uh, over Carlix data and so this I'll just uh, stand here to explain this to you um, we're talking about a mortality risk ratio so if there's no effect of food supply then it all hovers around this uh, uh, line here one um, the good food supply at any time in the grandparents uh, uh, life from conception up to 20 it's indicated in red and poor food supply in green so here we've got um, comparing age of grandfather and the food supply at various times with his grandson's mortality risk ratio so let, let's see what actually happened when we plotted it all out absolutely nothing at all just straight along on that line there with no effect whatsoever but of course I've tricked you this is the grandfather's um, uh, food supply uh, mapped against the granddaughter's mortality rate and the reverse so that is our null hypothesis coming out completely um, with um, the uh, um, doing the reverse grandson to grandfather to granddaughter and the other way around so what happens if we do it the right way around well this is the mid childhood period and you can see associations there with um, increased mortality uh, risk ratio uh, if there was a good food supply the grandfather and that translates into this developmental pedigree so we've got the food supply, 10 to 12 years, that was estimated way back in the 18, uh, 18, uh, 19th century. Um, and uh, we get this effect here, um, uh, sex specific. If you look at puberty, there's no effect uh, at all. If you look at the females, you get a similar things in the mid-childhood period and and then we get these rather marked things here but um, in early life exposure fetal and early life exposure but this this area is now uh, revised the reason is that when you get down to so close to conception um, it's very difficult to disentangle um, sudden change in food supply and we now have data suggesting that change in food supply uh, is relevant to, to these outcomes. And, and so that is revised. But this still holds that if the food supply is very poor in fetal life in the first, um, in uh, paternal uh, grandmother, um, then um, the uh, granddaughter would be affected. And this is just, uh, just to summarize what we published fairly recently on the question of change. This again was a, a new hypothesis, uh, a, 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 not a new hypothesis, a hypothesis based on previous uh, uh, thing about change um, of food supply. And uh, the interesting thing here is that the transmission is, is down the female's line, um, uh, down the, f uh, the, the grandmother and then uh, to the granddaughter. And for those sorts of populations, you have to correct also for consanguinity to try and guard against uh, uh, um, uh, genetic effects explaining some of these things. So the question was, could we, and we started this in 2003, could we find an exposure in Ausbach that would support this sort of uh, transgenerational effects? Well, obviously, we couldn't go easily back three generations um, uh, uh, as the historical stuff did but we decided to Gene felt that uh, Gene Golding that is um, felt that um, s onset of cigarette smoking um, the influence of cigarette smoking was probably the best um, exposure that we had at the time and so we hypothesize that if there were any transgenerational effect um, then it would be um, 
only with uh, smoking onset before puberty. Of course, in ALSPAC, we have all sorts of measures, so we had to be very careful to only select outcomes that were relevant to the Ovacarlex data. And, of course, we corrected for continued paternal smoking in order to test the onset of paternal smoking per se. And these are uh, a summary of the data. Um, here we have the BMI, and you can see that... Uh, um, um, this is the fathers who started smoking before puberty um, compare their off the offspring, their sons, uh, particularly their sons, um, compared with the rest. That's all the fathers who started smoking later and, and those who didn't smoke because we were particularly testing whether this slow growth period would hold up in another uh, population. And uh, you'll see that the BMI here it's the, the sons rather than the daughters that have a significant uh, increase in the BMI. And when we looked at it uh, with the DEXA scans and everything else we have in our spec, um, we find that it's the fat mass that is the most significant here, as you see. And we're talking here for quite, you know, five to ten extra kilograms of fat mass in the sons, and just the sons really, um, of fathers who started smoking. Uh, before uh, puberty, before the age of 11. We then decided to go back one further because we had good information on with the grandmothers smoking in pregnancy that produced the study mother or the study father, and then to look at the effect. So this is a model that we think is helpful to explore because there's chances of other cohorts being able to replicate this and uh, to get more of a handle on it rather than the historical side. And so um, this is uh, published uh, here, and we're basically talking about parental exposure in utero. This is not a three generation, it's the exposure in utero. Now, we're, we're, I'm summarizing it here, and we're looking for patterns. We can come back to the details if you want the statistics and so on. But um, we're looking um, down the father's side. I'm going to show you stuff on the mother's side as well, um, but on the father's side, because that's the one that's uh, particularly relevant to this unusual type of inheritance. And you will see that uh, if the father was exposed in utero, um, um, and, um, but uh, the, the, the grandchild was not, any of the grandchildren weren't, the mother wasn't a smoker, then what you got was an increase in the BMI and various things here um, on both sexes. But interestingly, um, it was largely lean mass, not fat mass. So this is exposure to the father when he's a, a fetus, and his future sons, and in this case daughters, have an increase in lean mass. Expose the father in mid-childhood and his future sons have an increase in fat mass. And um, when, they're, when both the mother and the father smokes, uh, in, uh, the, the grandmother and the mother smoke in pregnancy, um, there's this curious thing about uh, head circumference, which uh, we won't have time to go into, but that's published in uh, BMG Open. Now, what about down the mother's side? This is the first time we thought we would look at the mother's side as well. Obviously. The, the, it is interesting to know what happens. And this really, the most dramatic of all, I think, is this one here, where the study mother was exposed in utero, but the, um, she herself did not smoke uh, uh, in producing her children. Firstly, we see um, an effect just in boys with increased birth weight. So if the mother smokes in pregnancy, we all know you get a reduced birth weight. Uh, if the mother doesn't smoke in pregnancy, but she was exposed, you get an increase uh, in uh, birth parameters. And these boys go on to become rugby players. They have, uh, they have uh, uh, increased BMI, but it's due to lean mass, and they also have in, um, uh, increased uh, both cardiovascular fitness and grip strength at the age of 
12 and 13 when those were measured in Auspac. On the, um, with both mothers smoke, uh, uh, both the grandmother and the mother smoked on the female side, um, you get these other effects here. But I just want to go back one to the paternal thing here. Because what is striking, apart from this way with head circumference thing here, is no effect on the um, birth parameters, but all the effects coming, emerging, as uh, I'll show you, sort of uh, into adolescence. Now, what interests me about this, and this is the only speculation I'm going to give, is that concordant studies in monozygotic twins show our genes don't show their real colours until uh, adolescence. The concordance increases with monozygotic twins as you come to adolescence. So maybe some of this increased concordance uh, reflects a paternal transgenerational signal transmitted by that single sperm, which of course generated the monozygotic twins. I mean, these are testable hypotheses, um, um, but it, it is an interesting pattern that we see here. And this is just to show that um, this is the um, paternal grandmother smoking and the mother not. And you see, particularly in the boys, the um, uh, increased uh, uh, difference in lean mass and uh, compared with if uh, neither of them smoked. And, uh, and here, um, with the mother, grandmother, uh, maternal grandmother smoking and the mother not, again, just affecting the boys here uh, with uh, uh, lean mass um, exp being the main feature. Just to finish the other two uh, things I mentioned, the um, um, uh, Barbara Boucher is the only person I know who actually did the animal experiment way back in the early 90s uh, with betel nut, um, a transgenerational study, um, and, and then went and linked up with Tony Chen to to show it in the, in the um, Keeling community-based inter integrated screening program. And um, so this is the early onset of uh, metabolic syndrome there. When this study was uh, published, it was, um, the, the, they were um, late 30s, early 40s. Um, and this is the only other study that I can find, but economists, a bit like mathematicians, I think, tend to publish stuff without um, full, full comments. And this is not formally peer-reviewed, but, um, and they don't, their description of, it, of epigenetics is a little awry, uh, I might say, but um, nevertheless, um, the data are very interesting. They basically wanted to know, during the terrible famines of uh, uh, 1916 to 1918 in, in Germany, um, whether it had an impact on the grandchildren in, in the sort of way that um, uh, the Overcarlex data had. They set out to repeat the Overcarlex stuff. Um, and this is the summary, really. Um, exposure of the grandfather, paternal grandfather, um, in that famine at that mid childhood did indeed lead to an effect in grandsons, uh, increased uh, higher mental health scores um, in, uh, in grandsons. There's a hint of something down the maternal line through the mother, but uh, it, it's not. So where are we from these conclusions? Yes, it was a higher mental health score. Well, I, journalists always, whenever I talk to them, they say, oh, but isn't that the wrong way round? And we don't know enough about any of this to know what is the right way round. You know, a lot of people are surprised that a mother who doesn't smoke but was exposed herself by her own mother smoking in pregnancy um, has bigger grandsons. No, yeah. It's just what is the mental health score? What's this? Oh, the mental health score. Oh, sorry. Um, the mental health score is... Um, um, I've, um, I haven't got the details to hand, but it is a 12-point a score that... Um, ties in with um, rather like the household survey that they do in this country. They do it in Germany and uh, this is in every other year this um, is um, used as part of collection of other stuff. So it seemed fairly rigorous from, from my understanding.
So where are we from uh, these things? Mid-childhood, just before the prepubertal growth spurt, is an exposure-sensitive period for inducing a transgenerational response. We have the overcolex, the Ausback, and the German uh, data supporting that. Transmission and outcomes in descendants can be sex-specific, but not sex-limited. This is very important. We can all invent reasons why only boys get affected or only girls get affected because of their hormones and so on. But the granddaughters in overcolex get affected. Um, or indeed in the smoking of, uh, uh, studies, it's the granddaughters um, can be affected as well. Fetal life is also exposure sensitive period. And the mechanism is unknown. But obviously epigenetics is, is a strong candidate. and that's as far as we can go. Um, the review, I'm not going to go through this, it's just that in the review we just concocted every conceivable route that could come through uh, the male and female line. You have to think of the soma, you have to think of the reproductive system being, being um, primed, and you have to think of the germ line, i.e. what's free in the sperm, and then what's on the chromosomes and so on. And um, uh, interestingly, there's some animal data suggesting that seminal fluid can itself program um, the, uh, the uterus uh, uh, to change <coughs> outcomes. So we don't know what the mechanism is. So there's plenty of opportunities, but even worsely confounded down the female line. So we're going to stick to the male line. The overall conclusion then, early life experiences of parents and ancestors contribute to population developmental variation beyond that due to social transmission. I can show uh, the, the combination of things we see make it very unlikely that social transmission could explain this or genetics alone. This is not only important in its own right, but as a potential confounder of single generation studies. I referred to the, the wrong use of paternal um, uh, uh, exposures being um, uh, used as a control, as it were. And the main message is that cohort studies have to become multi-generational. And we've done all we can to persuade <coughs> the EU Horizon 2020-1916 call to put the word transgenerational <coughs> in it. And we'll just have to see. But final slide, a couple of slides, public engagement. It's entirely reasonable, and this was in 2013. We hadn't published the, the grandmother's smoking data and so on. Uh, but Adrian, you're very sceptical. Nothing worth the evidence that the lifestyle choice it even affects the children, let alone the grandchildren. Um, and then you get, with Chris Bell's online version of this paper, you get this, this terrible diagram. I, I have a be my bonnet about DNA molecules where they don't have the pairing rule between the four bases. <laughs> but, but this one's only got three bases. Oh. <laughs> so how to alter your DNA? Well, try and build it out of three bases, I might say. Um, but we also have to guard against it. And I'm picking up on this one from Adele, but you saw I made the same error in one of my slides earlier. I said the word affects instead of saying associated with. And uh, her title is exactly right for the paper, is associated with uh, hypermethylation. But in a commentary, in fact on our um, thing on smoking, uh, it's easy to slip into this um, differentiated methylation in response to paternal. We have no idea what's going on. So that's my final message. We're just beginning. We have no idea what's going on, but we will have to keep collecting this information in order to um, answer the questions eventually. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Do you want to um, take a seat over there? Shall I just take Is this off the screen? Easy to, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, Marcus ended up saying we have no idea what's going on, which implies that you've all spent the last hour of your lives completely wasted. Um, let's see if we can turn that around. Um, can I ask Matt He's Silver? Human, that, <laughs> human. Human. Can I ask Matt Silver? And um, so Matt is a, a, a bioinformatician in our group here at the London School. And uh, Professor Vardman Rakian is Professor of Epigenetics at Queen Mary's. And uh, we're going to ask them to make a few just um, general comments. Time is really rather pressing on us. We have about 20 
maximum 25 minutes. Um, and then we'll see where the discussion goes and then open it to the floor. Just before we do that, for some of you who may think, what on earth am I doing here? I would just summarize it in the, in the fact that we've already seen examples of how, first of all, important thing, males are going to matter. So let's not just hammer <laughs> women the whole time. Well, I'm saying that not, not because I want us to matter, but because much of our public health interventions and much of our criticisms about mums eating the wrong diet, etc. You know, concentrate on mums. So the males have got to take a share of this, and you've seen the example of the smoking, etc. But also you've seen examples of um, physical growth, nutrition. You've seen examples of smoking as an exposure, of economics and mental health. So this potentially has very broad implications. So, um, Wildman, as our visitor, would you like to start off? You're going to challenge us. <laughs> Um, well, firstly, uh, two really excellent talks by Lizzie and Marcus. Um, um, so I should start by saying I, I also do study epigenetic inheritance in mammals, um, but I would like to um, maybe play more of the devil's advocate here. There is a lot of controversy um, in epigenetics about these types of effects. Um, myself and Andrew were at an MRC meeting recently, and. Um, it was surprising how much time was taken up just discussing this, even though there's, there's at the mechanistic level in mammals, very little uh, hard evidence for what's going on. Now, in non-mammalian organisms, there is excellent evidence, uh, both in terms of the phenomena, the phenotypes, but more importantly, the mechanisms, the molecular mechanisms, and uh, such organisms as worms and drosophila and yeast as well. It's the mammalian side of things where it really does fall down in terms of hardcore mechanistic evidence. And I think that is, uh, predominantly that is maybe one of the reasons why there's so much controversy. Um, and just maybe, I, I don't want to say really too much, I think we have to keep an open mind about what's going on. Um, so within our own lab, we haven't ruled out the possibility of genetic changes happening in response to uh, whatever environmental perturbation you want to talk about. Um, we are very keen for replication to be done. So I, despite what one might say about GWASs, the important thing is, you know, these are large studies, great statistics, replicated by other groups. That has to happen within the field. Maybe you want to think about what is the ideal experiment? Um, beyond just what can be done in mice. Um, and, and finally, um, how important is this, is epigenetic inheritance, in terms of phenotypes of next, ge next generation, relative to genetics? Also, I think that is a very important question for us and maybe for funders as well. But can I maybe ask you to expand sure. on that a bit? Because um, a lot of people in the audience won't know what you're driving about when you're talking yep. about an interaction between epigenetics and genetics. Can you just help them a little bit with that? Um, well, okay, so the way I was thinking ab about it is... Um, so, um, well, okay, and, uh, so, so in terms of genetics, the genetics, it's, oh, sorry, genetics itself might change. So there are um, there are studies by a group in America, Michael Skinner's group, where they um, expose it to, expose the mice to, is it venclosalin, I think? Yeah. Is that right? Um, yeah. Um, and they observe effects, at least phenotypic effects, and they report methylation effects as well, one generation down the line, two generations, even three generations, so you know, truly multi-generational. There are recent studies, though, that have not been able to replicate it, um, and there are suggestions that its result, the the differences in phenotype when it was replicated was due to genetic differences. Genetics being altered by the original insult. Um, so that's, that's just one example of where there's so much confusion. The other thing I was talking about in terms of genetics is when you look at a person's, when you look at a person, you consider their phenotype. How much of it is due to what they've inherited in terms of genes? And by genes I mean DNA sequence. And how much of it is due to epigenetics as well? Now, that's an open question. I don't know. That may vary from person to person. That's what I meant to say. Thank you. Thank you. 
Matt, do you want to say a few introductory words? Then we'll open it up to a more general <coughs> discussion and questions. Yeah, well, two great talks, um, as Varman just said. So, um, so we've seen that there's this great um, epidemiological evidence from these um, multi-generational studies, as Marcus has described, of um, transgenerational trans effects, and also this um, very elegant mouse model where we see F2 effects on gene expression. But um, as with all these studies, and as Varman's just said, the mechanisms aren't clear yet the epigenetic mechanisms we can see the transgenerational transgenerational effects but we can't see the epigenetic mechanisms and, and the work we've been doing as well is, is looked at um, maternal effects this time just across one generation so there's, there's good evidence for intergenerational effects that may be me mediated by epigenetics but the, the difficulty is um as, as lizzie described there's this um for, for epigenetic effects to, to, to mediate transgenerational effects, there is two points in development that the, the epigenetic effects have got to escape. There's these two rounds of erasure, both just after conception and also for the, the primordial germ cells to be um, reprogrammed as well. So it's, it's really incredibly hard to imagine. I mean, so that there's already evidence of, of leaky effects leaking through at some of these junctions. A thought I had just, just listening is, um, I think, so we might be in a golden age because I think there's some tools are, are developing now where we could really prove this. So for example, there's the genome editing techniques, um, CAS, CRISPR, and, and I think there are, there are epigenetic analogues for those. So you can actually um, change epigenetic marks in F0, say, and um, intervene, change the epigenetic, epigenetic marks and see how they change over two or three generations. So I think that, that's a really promising avenue if we really want to sort of start to unpick whether these things sit, um, can at all be transmitted. And also I was um, thinking about this thing of what we're concentrating on pat uh, paternal line effects because of all the, all the um, problems with confounding and also this, this sort of cascading effects in, on the maternal line because you've got um, a maternal exposure possibly crossing back through the placenta um, to affect the next generation and so on, generation after generation. And I'm just wondering whether um, we can use in vitro fertilization to, to sort of unpick mm -hmm. some of those. Can you do those in, in mouse experiments? You can do... Yeah, you yeah. can do IVF in mice. And has, has that work been done then, looking at these same intergenerational effects and seeing whether they disappear? In, in the so we haven't done it in our model, but in some behavioural models they've done IVF and they say that they still get the effects with IVF, but those have been paternal transmission, so that's to right. remove the fact that the, the female, female mice are very good at detecting a suboptimal partner, so to remove the, the, the fact that she may be able to detect something, something fishy me. about her mate um, and demonstrating that you still have the, the but not not through the maternal line then. well there have yeah. been there have, uh, I know of one paper that's done that they've shown that um, the paternal line the maternal line yes, yes uh, is, uh, uh, with the IVF with the maternal line with the maternal line no um, they're all uh, have you put an embryo transfer showing that, that there are still that you can have a environmental effect around conception say and then transfer the embryo into a new uterus and still see an effect what I'm keen for us to do I'm very conscious that we've got a very general audience and that we don't want to dive too deeply into this science of is it true, is it not true. I, I, I'm trying to keep the conversation to something that can matter to all of us in this room. So Lizzie, I'd like to challenge you. I'm not sure if you were an author on it or not, but I know Anne Ferguson Smith was. Um, incidentally, it was lovely to see the picture of you outside my alma mater, Darwin College. Yeah, that was great. Um, so Anne is, a, it, and I can't remember the name of the first author, some complicated name, but it was in Cell September last year, I think, where they used the um, methionine reductase knockout. So let me just tell you quickly. So in mice, of course, you can do experiments where you knock out a, a gene, which then imp imposes a very um, uh, 
powerful nutritional constraint, if you like. So you knock out a gene that's important in the methyl donor pathway, methionine reductase, and then you say, what, does that, what effect does that have on the offspring? And you, know, you just then make them normally. And what the take home from me was, in the first generation, there's no effect, apparently. There's no phenotype. But the second, third, and if I remember rightly, fourth generations, they had very pronounced phenotypes. And what was interesting about these phenotypes was it wasn't one thing like the mouse equivalent of Silver Russell or anything, but it was a whole load of, of, of bad stuff going on. So they had excessively small babies, excessively large babies, and all sorts of cranial neural tube defects and things. So it seems to me that that's bringing this conversation back to something that could be of interest to everyone here, um, which is, you know, there could be multi-generational effects of a nutritional or other exposure. And when on the reverse, when we're trying to, um, for instance, reduce the prevalence of preeclampsia, we may be fighting against a battle of something that was put in train, as, as Marcus has said, really, two or three generations ago. So is that, am I on the right lines with that argument? Yes, I think so. So, so the... That paper was very elegant in that it ha they there was a, a they looked at the folate pathway and as you said there's this sort of extraordinary variety of effects and what they did which was very nice was they used tetraploid rescue so you can you can do f very elegant things with mice embryos so basically they took an early um, an early embryo and they gave it another placenta if you like so before the placenta is formed. They um, added in cells that go on to that because they ha they're tetraploid, they only contribute to the placenta, and so they demonstrated that they could rescue the that the um, growth phenotypes were from the from the placenta, um, but the other sort of malformation um, <coughs> phenotypes weren't rescued by that experiment. What's again, what's difficult is that um, so they then looked at imprinted genes and showed that they have altered methylation, and that may be underlying some of their some of their data, but development's so complicated it's very hard to get to the underlying mechanism for um, you know each one of those very different phenotypes that they found but it has sort of I think been quite provocative because I'm not very familiar with the folate data in humans but um, mm. as, as you said the first generation were fine so if, if we're going to look at so for example the influence of SNPs um, in folate um, enzymes in humans, we may be needing to look for them transgenerationally um, in human populations. And that sort of makes everyone's heads hurt, I think, when you come to both writing grant applications and designing it. But I think that's a, a very interesting <coughs> possibility from this, from this study. Um, and it's also very curious that the first generation are not affected as well. OK, let's open it up. I saw at least one hand up for a question. Do you want to have a go first? Yes. Um, and then I'll pre-warn Phil. I'm going to ask you to answer yeah. that question. I'm, I, I mean, it's a, it's a very valid question. Um, I, think, I think the first thing about the complication, uh, as an aside on the folate uh, uh, story, um, is that I personally would be worried if we were um, trying to reach those uh, mothers who have low folates by supplementing all our cereals and everything else with folate. There's, there is a debate about that uh, because what we've seen with these, these um, epigenetic effects and transgenerational effects, um, that um, it's complicated. The outcome may be for better rather than worse and we just don't understand enough to start playing around with the folate uh, levels in, uh, and, and um, 
in a, on a mass population level. So that's one thing. It's a negative, but nevertheless, it's, people are talking about giving folate, you know, supplementing food with, with folate and so on. Um, I think the, the answer is to target those who are, who are deficient uh, in some way. It may not be so cost effective. But in terms of the other things, I mean, there's a very practical point is that if we don't seriously investigate the, the, the size of this influence of transgenerational effects uh, on, on uh, developmental variation in the current population, then basically all our Barker hypothesis, everything else that just concentrates on the one population, is going to be confounded in various ways. And I mean, you know, GWAS has, has, has delivered, but um, I still feel that there's, we're missing a trick somewhere. I could talk at length about that, but um, um, we, uh, so I think there will be um, impacts on public health, but they will be largely to be a bit cautious before jumping in with two feet in uh, on the basis of some associations that we don't fully understand. PhD students in our group, Philip James, is going to be very cautious about jumping in with two feet. So do you want to just tell us, tell people what you're up to and how you hope it might get over there? I'm um, slightly uh, freaked out after this <laughs> talk. <laughs> what have I got myself into? But um, hoping to look at whether indeed, much later down the line, if we could look at nutraceutical interventions. So if we can um, more clearly define what is the nutritional insult that's going on um, for the mother who's, got a, a, who's pregnant with their child, and if that indeed does have an impact on the epigenetics of the child, is there a way that we can intervene and give a nutraceutical intervention to somehow correct um, what's going on? So we're looking at the public health impact of that. It's a long way down the line. Um, I'm involved in that um, for my PhD, so I'll keep you informed. <laughs> but um, I think there's a very important public health message that we need to at least ask those questions, um, even though we don't fully understand what's going on at the moment. So whilst Lizzie, Lizzie, if you could take the microphone up the back, I'll just supplement that answer. So, I mean, first of all, using the phrase nutraceutical, Phil, might be a bit of a red rag to a bull to some people. Maybe we can just talk about nutrition, although, yes, we do talk about the nutraceutical. But um, the, um, the thing, now we're talking within a single generation, but basically um, the paper that is going to come out in Matt's name in Genome Biology very soon is going to show that stuff happens and that it's related to the mother's diet at the time of conception. And that stuff we can infer is bad stuff because the normal patterns of imprinting are changed. Um, and therefore, one way to look at it would be to say, well, what can we do? Can we stop those abnormal patterns of imprinting? And that might give us a way to think about it. But in line with what you've said, Marcus, the approach mm. we would take is not to so folate to everyone, far from it, but to try and understand through in silico modeling what are the nutrients and what's going on very much more carefully before we intervene. So, um, Eugene Norton, I'm actually an obstetrician. Um, I really want you to allude to some of the translation of this work. If you take pregnancy, for instance, a whole nine months, is the epigenetic changes significant in the first three months, i.e. the first trimester, second trimester, or third trimester, and what role pre-pregnancy period may play in all this? Thank you very much. Very important question. Matt, would you like to take that on? Well, I think there's evidence, if you're just looking for changes associated with exposures in the different trimesters, that there's evidence for all three. And also, mechani mechanistically, in terms of understanding this, this, the dynamics of methylation programming, there are good reasons to um, suspect that, um, well, particularly, <laughs> actually, particularly conception and the first trimester and the third trimester, um, that they, they may be, you may see epigenetic um, changes in the epigenome associated with, with exposures. Um, 
So Lizzie gave a lovely example of the, you know, she started off her talk talking about how all the different cells have got to learn to be different cells and those 47 differentiating replications go through, with, there's 47 of those occur in utero or so we're told by David Barker and only two or three further ones that occur once you've popped out of your mum. So that immediately tells us that very important stuff is going on there. Uh, which will, of course, be affected by maternal nutrition and all sorts of other exposures. The things that Matt pap Matt's paper will concentrate on are little things called metastable epialleles, and they're just a device to tell us that the mother's diet has had an effect within the first few hours of conception. Um, and that's not really terribly surprising because Lizzie also showed you that that's the period where all this massive demethylation, the erasure, occurs and then the methylome is remethylated. So it's not terribly surprising that you can affect those processes within the first few days of conception. And that then brings it back to your question, which is, well, obviously, the, the mother's, it's not just what she eats on the day of conception, it's what she's been eating prior that you know, sets up her nutritional status. So we think that preconception would be very, very important. Do we have a, a, another question at the back, Lizzie? First, please. This is a question that might call for your use of crystal balls rather than scientific evidence. But uh, the reference to uh, lean mass, increase of lean mass in the third generation yes. uh, sounded very adaptive yes. to stresses. Uh, and that leads me to ask, do you suppose the next generation of epigeneticists to um, be looking for some mechanism for, of feedback from epigenetic responses to genetic mechanisms? That's so, a tough yeah. one. I assume yeah. that's for you, Marcus. Well, <laughs> obviously, I, I'm an inveterate speculator, and I've been very careful not to tell you what I, all the different things I think about those um, grandmothers, both sets of grandmothers, smoking uh, with non-smoking mothers. I mean, um, you can easily think in terms of um, the uh, female fetus inside the smoking grandmother the female fetus um, registering that there's there's um, a, a downward pressure on fetal growth um, and correcting for it in some adaptive way and then lo and behold the mother herself doesn't smoke and out pops the big boy who then becomes a rugby player so it it I mean adaptation seems to be uh, in there and then there's also a lot of stuff on the the sexual antagonistic theories of, you know, the, the paternal line and the maternal line have different um, agendas. And uh, there's quite a lot of evidence in, 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 in evolutionary work in a animals uh, to support this sort of tug of war, um, not, not, uh, and including uh, imprinted genes. Um, I mean, this question of uh, monozygotic twins only showing the full concordance when they reach puberty. Um, a lot of people interpret that as the early life is survival. Evolution requires you to survive and then when you get to puberty you switch to mate selection and reproduction. And you could think of it in that way. The survival is very much a maternally linked thing. I mean, obviously, throughout the gestation and thereafter, the, ma the maternal side is a big influence on that. It may be that the, the father just has to, he can only deliver the sperm in real sense. And so maybe he has to have a transgenerational effect and kick in there when it's a question of choosing mates and reproduction. Thank you, Marcus. Now, I'm watching the clock. We have uh, glasses of wine and beer downstairs for us, which I'm sure you're all very keen on. So, um, Maria, did you have one question? Okay, a comment. That would be perfect. Um, 
just kind of closing on the existence or non-existence of epigenetics, I think we also have some proof, for example, maybe because um, Ma alluded IVF, um, and we know, for example, that maternal age is a factor, and maybe what Lizzie was showing in terms of uh, oocyte development, you know, because people assume it might be mutations that accumulate in the oocyte that prevents maternal age mm -hmm. uh, conception, but it might also be quite a few epigenetic changes in lifestyle, and the fact that the oocyte is exposed to those changes that leads to con uh, difficulty in conception. And maybe because I'm a geneticist, in terms of genetics driving epigenetics, I think there's, there seems to be, at least from the basic science point of view, a bit more drive now to try to correlate the genetics with epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And um, the existence of maybe just variants driving the changes seems to be now quite under. Absolutely. There's a whole other story there, which sadly we don't get to have time to. A gentleman here, since that was a comment, thank you. We have just time for one last question. Mine's not a question, it's a recommendation. Great. Um, you should keep a diary. All of you are working in this fantastically interesting area, which as you say is controversial. Um, and it's fantastic today to read the diaries of people who were arguing about plate tectonics <laughs> around about 1900, 1910. That's what this reminded me of. Yeah? So please keep diaries, yeah? which is not a very popular activity anymore. But if we, it's, it'll, it'll be well worth it for the next generation, the generation <laughs> after that. <laughs> the generation <laughs> after that. <laughs> Culturally. Well, I mean, isn't that a wonderful spot to end on? Thank you very much for that, because it shows that at least one person in the audience was intrigued by what we were talking about today. So we're most grateful to you for that. And I'm immensely grateful to these wonderful speakers and, and discussants for their time. And you're now invited, after a round of applause in one second, you're now invited downstairs into the South Courtyard for drinks and nibbles and further conversation. So thank you guys very much indeed. Happy